Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. And welcome back, everybody. This gentleman does photography, but a little bit different. He does it from the air. And I'm talking about drone photography. He does traditional as well, but a lot of the stuff he's been working with is video, production, aerial photography, thermal imaging, and something called mapping, which I completely don't know about. So that's why I'm going to throw it at him. Adrian Hotel is with us once again on the program. Welcome back. How are you doing today? I am doing great. Thanks for asking. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So you now we pretty much have drone shots from above and we gave some examples, went a little deep into that last time. Mapping though, is that what I'm thinking? Like traditional mapping? Yeah, so it's a way of collecting data uh, using the drone to either map out construction sites, um, residential sites. Um, there's a project right now that's going on to map the entire state of Ohio. So uh, wow. collecting this type of data, looking at geospatial information and getting uh, near accurate, as, as accurate as we can get the information to be, uh, helps to, to visualize things. So think about Google Earth, but uh, doing that manually. Now, why why would you have to do that? I mean, if you have something like Google Earth or because it's so detailed? Well, if you look at um, kind of the use cases for it, so um, if I'm working with a construction company, which I do that quite a bit, they're looking at, say, buying a piece of land and they're in California. They want to know what the condition of that particular parcel is. So you can map that out, but it isn't just getting aerial images. You can get a topographical map of that. You can get elevation data. You can get you can get the data that they need to do earthworks and and site works and preparation. And, and once you map something like that out digitally, then you can add their their site plans to it. You can add plumbing, water, electrical. You can wow. add all those data to it in near centimeter accuracy uh, digitally. So you can share that with those different construction units and teams and they have a, a, a point to, to work from uh, remotely. So that's how it's being used a lot right now. Huh. Um, but yeah. What does that look like? So let's say you go up, you're taking the shots or video of a certain geo area. Um, what do you do with that? Do you give it to somebody else to add the detail or do you do that and then present it? Well, I can do the work. Um, so generally speaking, the software does the uh, processing of that data. Um, so the stronger the piece of software or depending on the detail of the type of software, you either have like Pix4D Survey or DJI Terra. Uh, those are things that process that data. Um, they look at the EXIF data that's on there, the geo data that's on there, and they get those points. And then the process is called photogrammetry. That's where the pictures come together um, to be able to stitch and overlap and create that map. And then usually in some kind of CAD software or something like that, you can take those overlays and add it. Um, there are even use cases where you have, um, you ever seen ODOT on a, or any department of transportation on the side of the road, they have your little base station in your rover where they're walking around the little metal pole. Yes. So that's, you can ping different GPS coordinates. So you say, you see an anomaly or you see where something is supposed to be. So uh, you usually pin your corners, your four corners of your particular site and then one point in the middle and all that data gets tied back into the drone so that it can geo-reference and geo-correct uh, the data that it's collecting from the air. So it's quite an involved process um, of doing, but once you create those points and you make sure that they are relatively accurate, then you can wow. use that to plot, plan, and, and process. How do you know this stuff? Uh, trial and error. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it started off you know, observing uh, I've seen some surveyors in the field doing things like that and just being genuinely curious. Um, there are several videos that I've watched online. I've talked to um, a couple of local colleges that train surveyors to try to just learn what it means. Because it isn't just putting the drone in the air and getting images. Anybody can do that. But you got to be a problem solver. What can the drone do more efficiently, more effectively, uh, and in less time? So that's one of the things that drones can help do. You can cover, you know, 100 acres in, in 20 minutes. <laughs> Um, now there are reasons to not necessarily do it that fast if you want data accuracy, but you can cover a large amount of territory relatively quickly. If you take the time to plan that out appropriately with your right uh, ground control points, then you can have an efficient, clean set of data that any construction site can use uh, relatively quickly. 
Amazing. 3D modeling is something else you do. Tell us mm -hmm. about that. Similar principles. So it's it's how you collect the data in a traditional mapping environment. You're going to do a nadir or straight down flight plan. When you're trying to do 3D modeling, you're going to have a series of different angles that you're going to you're, you're going to want to pick up. So six degrees, nine degrees, seventy five degrees. I sometimes do three different flight plans to catch those different angles because then the same process of photogrammetry with the right data can now recreate a 3D model deal of a building, a 3D model of a plot of land, really a 3D model of anything that you capture at that point. So those are used, uh, we create digital twins for say cell tower inspection. Um, then once you get done mapping that, you can basically send that cell phone tower to the client. And then you have all the individual images that are also stored that they can kind of inspect the tower virtually with high resolution images that they don't have to be on site to do. And if you've seen those towers, a lot of times they're really tall. So it's a safer, faster, easier way of inspecting a tower. I gotta believe that's something very important in the scheme of things because there's just any any issues structurally with those towers, uh, big damage could happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's the thing that, that gets interesting about it is it becomes a volume game at that point in time. You you can capture detail that you can't see from the ground that would take a you know a manned unit. So you know climbing up there, getting up to that point. Some of these these towers can be hundreds of feet tall, you know, and you can do that with a drone. The drone's not afraid of heights. <laughs> the drone's right. not going to fall. Well, shouldn't fall. Um, so you can do those things a lot more efficiently, and that's what's saving time, saving money, and really helping streamline this particular industry. So, and that's the interesting thing about it is you can that principle applies to just about anything. You can do a building that way. Um, there's a lot of tower inspections, bridge inspections, a lot of things pertaining to infrastructure. Damn, I had a uh, a conversation with DNR about inspecting dams to try to look for cracks and breaks and things in there that, you know, regular and, 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 and consistent maintenance items, you know, you can detect those issues ahead of time before it's, you know, cracking and, you know, you're having a dam rupturing. You can figure that stuff out ahead of time and do regular maintenance to it to keep it from having a, you know, a catastrophic event. So it's really wow. changing the game for a lot of things. Yeah, totally. And I, I got to believe saving money too, because, you know, somebody, I've heard of, because I, I work in the broadcast industry, to pay people to change, I'm not exaggerating on this, but this is what I heard, a very tall tower, and believe it's in Iowa, I mean, it is screaming high, don't know the exact mm -hmm. height, but to change the bulbs on the tower for um, navigation, somebody makes like 30 grand just to climb that tower, once, <laughs> <laughs> because it's so dangerous and there's no other way to do it. You know, you mm -hmm. can't send a, a drone up there to take it apart and, you know, change the bulb. And it takes right. them a long time to get up there. And you get, the, you know, mm -hmm. so many different weather conditions. I'm talking, it is mammoth, this tower. Kind of uh, uh, almost world famous because it's so tall. But yeah, so this, instead of somebody climbing, you know, not that high of a tower, but uh, just to structurally check things out. What's the highest that you've ever flown a drone? What do you think? Well, the highest that I've ever flown, well, the number is pretty high. It was roughly 8,700 feet, 8,800 feet. And the only reason for that is because I was on a mountaintop in Nevada. Ah. <laughs> and I could fly from, so the hotel that we stayed at was 8,400 feet up, 8,336 or something like that. So I took some pictures and captured a storm coming in cool. towards the mountains from there. But yeah, so the highest legal limit 400 or 400 feet above your particular structure. So in that case, I just took off from that high elevation. I said, all right. Hmm. Interesting access. way to maybe get around it because you're already up that high. So another you know, few hundred feet, but let's say you're at ground level, ground level, whatever, sea level. Let's go with sea level. Um, the highest that you could fly is about 400 feet ish. 400 feet, 400 feet is the legal, is the legal limit. It doesn't mean that you can't fly above that. You just have to have special permission to do so. Got it. So okay. the drone can fly, you know, the, the drone can do many things. It's just, you're, once you're operating above a certain airspace, then you have to get permission to operate in that airspace, which is not impossible. But sure. you have to go through the right notifications and let people know where you're going to be flying, when you're going to be flying and how long you're going to be flying. So there are steps to take to be able to do that, but it is possible to do. So out of curiosity, 
Um, if you could push a drone, sky's the limit, li literally, and you wanted to send it up, what do you think the highest that you, where you're on the ground and you're going to send it up? How high do you think? Well, technically speaking, I think the M350 is rated to like 12 miles or something like that. Wow. So if it can go 12 more miles out, I imagine it could still be able to go at least that up. And the, the, the piece being is being able to maintain your signal is the issue. The drone that's, could probably keep going. It just won't have a signal. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> where I was feeling. That yeah. was my next question. So you're saying if you're at point A, you can take it out to point B up to 12 miles on that one particular? It, and it depends on, yeah. So the I, I believe... Uh, the Matrice 350 RTK has a 12, something in there. That's what I'm thinking. Wow. Um, wow. Some of my smaller drones are, you know, two miles, two and a half miles that you can okay. see. Usually, you know, the ruling for things is beyond visual line of sight is the legal. So how long can it physically go? Well, it's longer than that, but everything so, in, in the efforts of safety first, you want to, you want to keep your eyes on your, on your prize. So, to so I'm understanding now that, it can go rule of thumb, you know, not, we're not talking you know, legally here, but you know, just the best, best practice from where you can see it. So if you can't see yep. it anymore, it's probably a little too far away. Yep. Hmm. Yep. Interesting. And now the only situations where I fly traditionally farther is when I'm mapping a large piece of, uh, you know, land out. So on some of the construction jobs or sites or, you know, agricultural based pieces, um, you can get a little bit far away, but I plan, I generally plan flights by battery time as well. So mm -hmm. in that standpoint, shouldn't get too far away from me, but. Have you ever gotten lost? Let's say it's out there. Do you always know where it is or worst, worst case scenario, return to home, it'll come back to you? I have lost the drone before. And, like like uh, lost gone or lost gone never recovered never saw oh my anything. my heart i mean it's just, I, it's just like <laughs> oh oh painful well it's operator any, any time that happens it's usually the pilot's fault and in this case it was the pilot's fault um oh. there are certain things that you can do to start off um i was in a remote area i did not allow for the satellites to get connected um i was in a hurry to get the work done so i kind of just took off and it'll fly and it continued to fly completed most of the mission when it came time to return home it had recorded a home point somewhere not where i was oh my gosh <laughs> so, so what i yeah. what i heard you say is satellite point so it's setting up coordinates or you should before you take off so now you have reference points and it sounds like you just look let's go went up and yep yeah, that's the what's that one of the rules they found in the machuism. You just nah, man, I got this, and you don't have this. So it's that's... always good to make your safety checks from the get go, and pretty much any time you don't do that, you're setting yourself up for failure. That's crazy, you know how that because then if it's if it's up there, you what do you got to work with? Just let's say you're in the woods. All right, trees. I don't know where those trees are. So where, how am I going to even bring it home if I wanted to? Um, and then if you press the home button, I mean, by that time now your, your, your battery's probably on its you know tail mm -hmm. end there. Wow. Sorry. Well, the thing about <laughs> it, you, you, the, the recommended procedure is to record, get your home point saved and recorded as you should before you take off. So in that situation, had I have allowed for the home point to set itself, yeah, then when I lost signal or the drone battery got to its end, it is programmed to return back to me. But since in this particular case, I didn't set the home point, it, mm. it set one somewhere in the air and goes, okay, I'll come back here. I don't know where you are. I don't really care, but this is my home point. Wow. Wow. I'm yeah. not going to ask you how much that drone cost. Yeah, well, you know, hey, I had two of them. That makes, you know, doesn't make it better, but yeah. <laughs> Always have backup. Um, yeah. Do you enjoy doing video production? Video production is exciting. It can be fairly demanding depending on, you know, when you think of an army of one or you, you really need a 
several different people part of the process, you know, production. A lot of times people don't necessarily know what they want. Uh, they know what they essentially want the end product to be, but there's a lot of planning that goes into it. So I work more so with the team and we talk out things. A lot of the work is done before you even get the camera out by mm -hmm. having a conversation with the end client. Say, what do you need shot? What is the storyline that you're trying to sell? You know, talk about, is this for product selling? Is this for, you know, what is it that you're trying to accomplish with this video? Because the thing about it is people like things, you know, quick and fast uh, and they want it to be inexpensive. And a lot of times that's not the case. Um, that guy called me yesterday because yeah, man, uh, I got nine buildings. I want you to take a look at and capture video before and after. Um, I want you to edit it. I want you to score it to to music, and you know, I want all these things. He was saying, man, can I do like three hundred? I'm like an hour. <laughs> yeah. So there, there's a lot of unrealistic expectations uh, as to what it takes to actually create these things. Sure. Um, so for like every every hour of film footage that you collect. To me, it's like five to 10 hours of editing on top of that. So all of those things come into play. And so that that's time. You know, if you want a good quality, mm -hmm. solid editor, that's time. So that's the thing that I think in the industry, a lot of people want the marketing. They want to see, hey, I want, I want something for social media. I want to do this. I want all this content, but I don't want to pay any money for it. Um, and I think that goes without saying in a lot of different areas, people... You know, because there's, there's, you know, every time they can carry out there can, can, can do some type of footage. So it becomes to devalue the market, you know, but I enjoy I it, but I don't enjoy having to try to convince somebody of what it actually costs to do the work. For sure. Well, they're, they're not the right clients and nor there they are for anybody. You know what they're, they're a perfect client for? Perfect. One of these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said, get in, get out your phone and have at it. I was like, you want me on nine groups? Yeah, and you want that twice? And oh, like, okay, all right. Yeah, apparently he he hasn't checked the price of gas lately because even just a drive right. to you know, alone or whatever. Um, right, right. And just the editing, there's so much involved, right down to color correction and all of that. Mm -hmm. It's it's it takes a lot of time to and and you know what? If somebody's doing video. You're up against other productions that could be much more higher in budget. So you want to at least, even if it's a YouTube ad, you know, you're up against the video, music video that, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more, you want it to be at least in the zone. So it takes time mm -hmm. to, even for 30 seconds, it's got to look good. There's a lot that goes into that. For sure. Well, you think about the Super Bowl, you know what I'm saying? How much money do they pay for that 30 second spot? Oh, oh. So and, it, and I bet you they didn't get out a cell phone to make it. Now, if it's Apple, I'm sure they, <laughs> they've done something that way. But, well, you know, that would be that yeah. would be something there if they shot it all with, with an iPhone, right, and edited it in the phone, did nothing but. I have a friend that used to work with her in radio, and she got a little hobby, but now it's turned into, you know, some side hustle action. And she's taking photos, like events. You know, let's say somebody has a, a christening or something like that on her phone, on her phone. But I mean, this is, you know, that's that's a lower level kind of thing. What we're talking about here, you know, different type of you know, uh, production value. I'm not even mad at that because if you look at the iPhone 15 Pro Max, it can shoot Apple ProRes, it can shoot 422, it can shoot ProRes. You can do some things with it. It's not, Yeah, that isn't even necessarily the issue what you're capturing with because you can go out and get some high-end glass and spend thousands upon thousands of dollars and maybe not have a better result than what you get when you're sure. editing off the phone. So it isn't, isn't that, you know, if you can capture the right things with the phone in the editing room is where it comes to life. So totally. Yeah. yeah I'm not mad at all about somebody capturing the phone. I do it sometimes myself, but. But there's, there's also something called creativity that you need to start with, then the equipment, then the editing, and then the creativity has to lend itself. Not like, you know, you don't get, uh, you know, Premiere and start editing and, oh, we're done. You press a button. doesn't work that way either. So right. there's a lot along the process. On on your website, in the portfolio, there are some photographs. Of course, some of them from the sky, obviously taken by a drone. Some of the ones that were taken on the ground. Uh, what are you using for that? Is that uh, like a DSLR or what's going on there? Yeah, so I have a Nikon D850. Um, which I've been using for most of my real estate photography that I do. Um, I've shot Canons a few times, but mostly the, the DSLR. Um, I do more of a bracketed shot list. 
uh, taking multiple exposures to merge those together. That's kind of sure. my place. It's easier for me to shoot that way than try to get the lighting right every single sure. time. Um, but yeah, DSLR shots. Yep. Um, I am going to try the whole cell phone versus DSLR. So put the cell phone in raw mode. I want to see. I just want to see where it ends up. I'd love to see that. By the way, big fan of yeah. Nikon, and I have friends that are you know into Canon, and we have these debates all the time. Um, you know, the funny thing is, <laughs> the uh, the millimeter size of the lens can't can't swap them out. So, right, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that hurts your feelings. You look at the Z series. I tried to. Uh, I went and picked up a Z uh, a Z six two, and tried to put my D D A fifty lens on there, and it just you know hurt my feelings. Yeah, it yeah. Like it. <laughs> <laughs> and for yeah, anybody, I should have known that. I just yeah, you know. Yeah. You know, when you mentioned raw, for anybody that doesn't know, raw is just the highest quality you could possibly get. File size is huge. You know, as yep. opposed to you know, um, sixteen megapixels or whatever it might be. This is whew, much, much more going on there. But yeah, interesting. You know, to compare the two, what what it might look like. What yeah, and because the the phones are you know they're really they're really coming along well, and you know for certain settings, certain situations, I imagine you can get pretty solid results. Sure, and I've noticed a difference. I I'm not an Apple person, uh, so I I got a. I had a 21 Galaxy and just got a 24 like two weeks ago. And with the camera, I notice a difference. I really do. Mm -hmm. Like there is a certain sharpness going on there that I didn't have previously. And everybody would come to me, hey, take you take the picture. Your your camera is good. This is mm -hmm. even better. So, you know, another two years down the road because you only get two years on your battery. <laughs> Time for another right, phone. Right. <laughs> they got like, you there. Yeah, get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh Adrian, how do we how do we find you? How do we connect with you? Where will you go if it makes sense, you know, geographically to to do a project? So I'll travel anywhere. Like I said, I've done a couple of uh, international projects, uh, mostly Belize, um, but uh, try to stay within Ohio, Columbus region. But I travel all through Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Kentucky. Uh, it all depends on the opportunity and what needs to be sure. done. Uh, so that doesn't that doesn't bother me to travel. It's just got to be worth my while to travel. Hundred uh, percent. But you can check out things on the website as you mentioned, a r o aerial uh, dot com. The email is the same, a r o aerial at gmail dot com, or directly on my cell, which is four one nine six one two eight three seven nine. Or there is a separate business line, which is six one four six two two eight seven eight six. Awesome. And the one thing uh, we didn't really get into, we mentioned it quick last time, was the roof inspections, where mm -hmm. you know, if somebody is in that line of work, contracting, whatever it might be, instead of depending on a human on a roof, just another way to get it done more efficiently and maybe even with more detail, I would have to imagine, too. And documentation. Yeah. So I've done what I traditionally do is map out a roof or basically take enough pictures of that roof, stitch it together to create a digital twin of the roof. Uh, in the same standpoint, you can get high resolution images that can depict uh, certain anomalies that are on the roof. Now, not everything. Um, so there are certain things that can require physical inspection. For instance, if the roof itself is soft, the drone can't pick up the fact that there's soft or dry rotting or any of those types of things on the roof, but it can pick out your major anomalies that are on there in an easy to share digital way. Because you think about that when you're working with the adjusters and things, they're going to want some kind of pictorial proof. Sure. So you'll be able to have the images that you need to be able to do that and a way to circle through those. There's even uh, a program that I've used that has an AI aspect or component of that that after you scan the roof digitally it'll go through and use ai to pick out and highlight the anomalies wow so there's a lot of technology that is being used to, to really streamline this and and add some additional pieces and the thing that i like too is on the thermal end so the thermal end of things sees where there's heat loss that you can't see with the naked eye so i like the combination of thermal and standard rgb to be able to inspect and pull together a roof. so it's quicker yep yep um, so, so many different uh, things you can get done with a drone that I think a lot of us don't think of. Uh, or maybe the people are aware, but didn't know you do it. So there we go. Yeah. Uh, appreciate you being here and all the insight and uh, short moment of silence for that lost drone. And uh, we'll, catch, <laughs> we'll catch up next time, okay? All right. Take care. Thank you. We'll be right back. Yeah. 
Are you looking for even more of the podcasts and hosts that you love? The Podcast Business News Network is proud to announce that you now have even more ways to listen live. Check out the MyTuner Radio, Online Radio Box, and Simple Radio apps on iOS and Android, or find us online. Search for Business News Network on MyTuner-Radio.com, or search Podcast Business News Network on Streama.com and OnlineRadioBox.com slash US. Take your podcasts on the go and don't miss a minute of the action. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's... It's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage free, fully adaptive, handicap accessible house, and there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit HFOTUSA.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's. It's going to be okay.